Hi there, and welcome to The Daily Gardener, a show about gardening, botanical history, and literature. I'm your host, Jennifer E. Blaine, and today is April 8th. Happy anniversary, Mom and Dad. Today we celebrate one of the most prolific garden writers of the 1800s, and we'll also learn about a Hollywood legend who ate roses. We'll hear an adorable poem about the crocus, and we grow that garden library today with a book that helps us make our own little piece of heaven here on earth in the form of a garden. And then we'll wrap things up with the living legacy a garden that honors the memory of a trailblazing first lady. But first, here's today's curated news. Today's curated news comes to us from The Olympian. This is an article that was written by Marianne Benetti, and Marianne's post is called The Top 10 Things to Do for Your Garden This Spring. Well, first of all, Marianne's list includes many of the usual suspects. She talks about weeding and taking care of your lawn and picking an out-of-the-way or obscure spot in your garden to hide or conceal your compost pile. That said, Marianne had three or four suggestions that I wanted to share with you on the show today. First, she talks about pruning back tall roses. She says to cut back your hybrid tea roses down to 24 inches to make your plants more compact. And she also reminds us to clean up our rose clippings because that kind of debris can help spread rose diseases. So we definitely do not want that. Another tip that I liked said to dig out sick, damaged, and ugly trees, shrubs, perennials, berries, and ground covers now. And she's totally right about this because the time to get at these plants is when they're just starting to get going. You want to get them before they really start to put on vigorous growth. And I love how Marianne phrases this. She says, the weak need to get out of the way so that the healthy can start building a better garden. And then check this out. She says, plants are not your children and you do not owe them a lifetime commitment. Life is too short to put up with ugly plants. Message received, Marianne. Thank you for that. Finally, the last tip that I wanted to share on the podcast today is Marianne's suggestion to visit a nursery. I say this to people all of the time. If you're having a bad day, if you are needing inspiration, if you need help remembering the names of your plants, a nursery visit can be so transformative for both you and your garden. And I love what Marianne wrote for this one as well. She says, you will learn a lot just by walking around and reading plant tags. And isn't that the truth? Now, if you enjoy these little snippets that I've shared with you from Marianne's post, you can find her online. She has a website. It's called BenettiGarden.com. And Benetti is spelled B I N. E-T-T-I, so BenettiGarden.com. So check it out if you get a chance. Now, if you would like to read Marianne's post in detail for yourself, I've shared a link to it in the Facebook group for the show. And all you need to do to find it is head on up to the little magnifying glass at the top of the page and type in the number 10 and Marianne's post, the top 10 things to do for your garden this spring will pop right up and you can read every one of her suggestions for yourself. Now, if you're not in the Facebook group and you want to read Marianne's post, just remember that you have a standing invitation to join this free private Facebook group. And to do that, just head on up to the search bar where you'd search for a friend and type in the words Daily Gardener Community and then request to join. I'd love to see you in the group. It's time for today's Botanical History. 
Here's botanical history for today, April 8th. Today is the birthday of the Scottish author, garden designer, and botanist John Claudius Loudon, who was born on this day, April 8th in 1783. A massively popular and breathtakingly prolific writer on horticulture, John focused on serving the expanding middle class who wanted to have smaller gardens. In 1838, John wrote a book called The Suburban Gardener and Villa Companion, and in it he wrote, A suburban residence with a small portion of land attached will contain all that is essential to happiness. John Loudon created and published a magazine called The Gardener's Magazine, and it started out as a quarterly publication, and the very first issue sold 4,000 copies. And so, it soon became a bi-monthly publication. And John used the platform of his magazine to introduce a new landscape perspective that he called Gardenesque. Now, before John, the prevailing landscape style was the picturesque view. In contrast with the big picture, John wanted to draw attention to individual specimens isolating them by removing surrounding plants or by using geometric beds. And this makes sense if you think about the time period in which John was living. During John's lifetime, exotic plants were all the rage, and cultivating a very controlled garden was the very best way to feature specimen plants. So this is how John develops his gardenesque style. It was also known as the plant collector's garden, and it incorporated elements like formal features and botanical variety, both of which were very popular with Victorian gardeners. Now, as for John, he had a thing for circular beds. He really liked their simplicity. They show off plants so easily, and they're instantly recognizable as the work of a human, as opposed to something natural. You have that perfect circular garden as a focal point in the landscape. And this underscores how John thought about gardens. John said, any creation that's to be recognized as a work of art should never be mistaken for a work of nature. And so that tells us that John saw those circular beds, those man-made aspects in the garden. Well, John considered those to be works of art, man-made creations, and not works of nature. And here's a little fun fact about John. He invented the term arboretum, which is a garden of trees that's often designed for scientific or educational purposes. And John also had some very modern thoughts about the value of public green spaces in cities. In fact, he even called these spaces breathing zones, which I find fascinating in light of the COVID-19 pandemic. Now, in the middle of his life, John married the writer Jane Webb, and Jane was indispensable to John especially in the back half of his life. After an attack of rheumatic fever in 1806, John suffered from reduced mobility in his limbs. And it got so bad that after 20 years had passed, his right arm ended up needing to be amputated at the shoulder. And this happened without anesthesia. And when the doctors 
found John in his garden. He basically told them that he wanted them to get it over with so that he could go right back to spending time in his garden. Now, the story of John's death is also one that I find compelling because you can so vividly picture the circumstances, and it's really quite poignant. Around midnight on December 14th in 1843, John was dictating a book to his wife, Jane, something he did all the time when he suddenly collapsed into her arms and died. The book was his final legacy, and Jane completed it for him. And the title of the book I also find rather fitting. It's called Self-Instruction to Young Gardeners. And today is also the birthday of America's sweetheart, Hollywood legend, and lover of trees, Mary Pickford, born Gladys Marie Smith on this day, April 8th in 1892. If you jump on Twitter and search for Mary Pickford Tree, you'll see images of Douglas Fairbanks and Mary Pickford planting a tree at their Pickfair estate. Mary Pickford became the very first person to plant a tree. It happened to be a Japanese cedar in the Forest of Fame at the California Botanic Garden. Now, my favorite piece of trivia or folklore about Mary Pickford says that she used to eat flowers, especially roses, because she thought they'd make her beautiful. And while the jury's still out on their effectiveness, Mary Pickford was unquestionably beautiful. And there's a very sweet little song by an artist named Katie Malua, and it's called Mary Pickford. And the very first verse starts out this way. Mary Pickford used to eat roses, thinking they'd make her beautiful, and they did. One supposes. Well, apparently, Mary Pickford did actually eat roses to make herself look more beautiful. She revealed in her biography that was called Sunshine and Shadow that when she was a young woman growing up in Toronto, she would buy a single rose and then eat the petals, believing that the beauty, color, and perfume would somehow get inside her. Now, Mary enjoyed gardens, and she even gifted one of her leading men, John Gilbert, a bench for his garden. And in researching Mary, I found this wonderful little quote, a little story about what happened after she saw one of Charlie Chaplin's movies. She said, I do not cry easily when seeing a picture. But after seeing Charlie Chaplin's A Woman of Paris, A Drama of Fate, that was released in 1923, I was all choked up. I wanted to go out in the garden and have it out by myself. And then she writes this last little line, which I think is absolutely precious. She writes, our cook felt the very same way. Isn't that a little sweet validation there for Mary Pickford? It's time for today's Unearthed Words. Today's Unearthed Words come to us from the New Hampshire poet, Lilja Rogers, and it goes like this. First, a howling blizzard woke us. Then the rain came down to soak us. And now, before the eye can focus, crocus. It's time to grow that garden library with today's book, Heaven is a Garden by Jan Johnson. This book came out in 2014, and the subtitle is Designing Serene Spaces for Inspiration and Reflection. 
Well, Jan is one of my favorite modern garden writers. She's a fellow garden geek, and she's logged over 40 years in garden design, helping people create the gardens of their dreams. And so, Jan has this tremendous breadth of experience when it comes to gardens. Now, what's fantastic about this particular book is that Jan is sharing the secrets to making your garden a heavenly place to relax and restore your spirit. And to do this, Jan focuses on three aspects of heavenly gardens, simplicity, sanctuary, and delight. And as someone who's helped thousands of people create the gardens of their dreams, Jan understands the magic that can happen when these elements are incorporated into the garden. For instance, Jan writes about tiny spaces that she calls power spots that are incredibly restorative and grounding. And as a designer, Jan understands the allure of something she calls a sheltered corner, or how certain trees are especially good at creating a restful atmosphere. Now, boundaries are also essential in gardens, so Jan spends time talking about fencing and markers and why east-facing garden gates are naturally welcoming. Other garden elements that help create a heavenly garden include water, color, and stone. Finally, what I love best about Jan is that she writes beautiful books that speak directly to a gardener's heart. So, in a nutshell, she speaks gardener. And if you'd like to connect with Jan or read more about her work, you should really check out her blog. It's called Serenity in the Garden. I put a link to it in today's show notes, and I know you're going to love it if you decide to stop and visit. It's a beautiful little space, a place that you can go to find garden inspiration online. This book is 160 pages of how to create your own little piece of heaven right here on earth through the transformative power of a garden. You can get a copy of Heaven is a Garden by Jan Johnson and support the show using the Amazon link in today's show notes for around $9. Finally, here's something sweet to revive the little botanic spark in your heart. Today is the birthday of the beloved First Lady, Betty Ford, who was born on this day, April 8th in 1918. As a woman, Betty Ford consistently defied the odds. She was a dancer, she loved to have fun, she was an incredible trailblazer, and very open about her personal struggles with alcohol and breast cancer. Betty revolutionized addiction treatment, and she even opened her own center for treatment while she herself was in the middle of working on her own recovery. Today, the Betty Ford Alpine Garden is a fitting living tribute to this wonderful woman. Known as Vale's Alpine Treasure, the garden was founded in 1985 by the Vale Alpine Garden Foundation. And in 1988, it was renamed in honor of the former First Lady, Betty Ford. This special place is located in Ford Park, and it's right next to the Gerald R. Ford Amphitheater, which is named in honor of Betty's husband, the 38th President of the United States. Now, over the years, the Betty Ford Alpine Garden has evolved, and it now comprises four distinct gardens. There's the Mountain Perennial Garden, which was created in 1989, the Mountain Meditation Garden, which was created in 1991, the Alpine Rock Garden, which was created in 1999, and finally, the Children's Garden, which was created in 2002. 
Today, over 3,000 species of high-altitude plants play host to children's programs, horticultural therapy activities, and numerous partnerships and conservation initiatives. Back in 1991, Betty said, When I was a little girl, I spent many cherished hours with my mother in her garden. She wisely marked off an area for my very own plants. As we worked together, she nurtured me as she nurtured my love of gardening. This nurturing mother-daughter relationship with its love growing strong in a garden has been passed along to my own daughter, Susan, and to her two girls. When we first talked about plans for the Vale Alpine Gardens, I never dreamed that it would grow and flourish to such magnitude. But as each season brings new blooms and greater beauty to the gardens, they become a source of infinite pride and pleasure for all of us. Each week provides a different, more beautiful picture. As someone who's always loved gardening, it fills me with a great sense of serenity, just walking along these winding paths with the abundance of beauty so close to the touch brings an introspection and sense of calm that's too often missing in our lives. And if you fast forward almost 40 years after Betty spoke those words, in December of 2019, you'll see a tweet from the Denver Botanic Garden. They wrote, Colorado's alpine plants are impacted from climate change. With Betty Ford Alpine Gardens, we are finalizing the North American Botanic Garden Strategy for Alpine Plant Conservation to serve as a blueprint for protecting these fragile species in the United States and Canada. Thanks for listening to The Daily Gardener. And remember, for a happy, healthy life, garden every day. The Daily Gardener is produced in lovely Maple Grove and Wyoming, Minnesota, with the help of Paige Mance, Brooke Bierbaum, and Eric Begay. If you want to read today's show notes, just head on over to thedailygardener.org. And while you're there, be sure to sign up for my free Friday newsletter. And don't forget that you have a standing invitation to join the free Facebook group for listeners of the show. Just search for Daily Gardener Community the next time you're on Facebook and request to join. Last but not least, you can always get in touch by emailing me at jennifer at thedailygardener.org. I'm your host, Jennifer Ebling, and as always, have a great day in the garden, and we'll see you tomorrow. Tomorrow.